Let's look to the Lord now. Lord, we do come to your, to your book. We come, Lord, with a needy heart, very needy hearts this morning. But we know that you are sufficient for all of our needs, so we ask you to meet our needs now, Lord, through your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew eleven twenty-five 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them to, unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, leading up to this section here, we have, we, we're uh, about to cover, the Lord has, what he's done is he's declared how he's going to, previous to this, he's declared how he's going to judge the cities. He says in verse 20 here, Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. So he's the great judge. He said already, he said in John 5, uh, verse 22, he said that in John 5, 22, the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. That's him. So the Lord has revealed here in this passage just um, how he's going to judge the cities according to, evidently according to degrees is what we gather in these degrees of these, um, we can only imagine eternal torment in this final judgment. He's talked about in verse 22 things that are going to be more tolerable at the day of judgment. And we don't know what those degrees of judgment are. We really don't want to know. Uh, but he did explain what at least determines these degrees of judgment when he says in verse 20, then began he to abrade the cities where most of his mighty works were done because he said they repented not. And then he says in verse 21, this situation, if the mighty works which were done in you, and he goes on. He says in verse 23, if the mighty works which have been done in thee, mighty works. So what we learn from these passages here, from these verses, is that the more mighty works that the cities saw and didn't repent as a result of, the greater their judgment, the greater their guilt was, the greater their, their, their consequent judgment is going to be. I mean, this is what he's been talking about. Judgment, levels of guilt, degrees of eternal torment. Yikes! <laughs> this is all dark. This is all very, very dark subjects. And, and, and this is what he's been thinking about, these very, very dark subjects. I mean, we, all, we have all been plagued with dark thoughts, very dark thoughts. We've all been in, in dark, very dark situations, like the death of a loved one. And the question is, what do you do when you're in these dark situations? What do you do when you have these very dark, these dark, very dark thoughts how do you combat those? How do you combat dark, very dark thoughts? And what, so this is what's so interesting because what the Lord did when he had these dark, very dark thoughts, as we just were talking about, about the, the, the levels of guilt and, and, and eternal judgments and so forth. And what he did to, to, it, with these dark thoughts is in verse 25, it says, at that time, Jesus answered, and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Now, so what the Lord did when he, to combat this onslaught of dark thoughts in verse 25 was, I, what he did was, I thank thee, is what he did. And that's the way for us, that's the way for us to combat these dark thoughts in our lives. By thanking God for what he has done by praising God for how great he is, by singing to God these, these, the, the worship for who he is. That's our ticket out of darkness. 
That's the hallway out of the caves of gloom and doom. And that's what we see the Lord doing here in verse 25 here with the I thank thee. And that's what makes the word in verse 25, which is otherwise we don't understand, the word answered. Because he, 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 we read this in verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said. And we say, answered? I didn't hear anybody ask a question. I, I don't see anybody here uh, asking a question. So why in verse 25 does it say Jesus answered? Who asked him a question that he was answering? Well, what was happening here, it was all those dark thoughts about the guilt and the judgment that were challenging the Lord with questions as they challenge us. Questions like, well, just look at all those cities that didn't repent. Don't you just feel like giving up? Yeah. Um, look at all those cities that have so much guilt. Doesn't that kind of weaken you? I mean, look at all those cities that perished because they didn't, they didn't, they, they didn't respond to all the mighty works. Doesn't that depress you? And so what's your answer to all these questions, Jesus? And his answer is, verse 25, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. And that's our answer to the questions of darkness. It worked for me. I mean, when my wife of 44 years died, darkness was invading my spaces was invading my spaces, and I answered, and how did I answer darkness? I put together a CD with a hundred hours of music, a, a, a great gospel music, music of praise, music of worship, and I just played that music all the time. I played it in the bathroom, I played it in the car, and it drove the darkness out and continues to. And so he's thanking God at this point for hiding the gospel from the wise and the prudent and for revealing the gospel to babes. Now, we, we see more of what he's doing when we look at a parallel passage in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 21, Luke 10, 21, where in this parallel passage it says, in that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, it seemed good in thy sight. So he's rejoicing here, it says. He's thinking about those babes having the gospel revealed it to, 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 to them and, and then them being saved, and it's causing him to rejoice. He's really happy. He rejoices when a person is saved. This is Jesus. This is our Savior. This is why we love and adore him. The salvation of souls is now his focus. And he's thinking about how the gospel is going to be revealed to these babes and they're going to be saved and he's rejoicing. And, 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 this is, and this has come right after he's covered the subject of darkness. But something else to see about this is that this has come right after he, him, him speaking about how... He, how deeply he has been rejected, and John the Baptist has been rejected by people who are acting like children and not responding to the messages of John the Baptist and, the, and, the, uh, and him, which he likens to, to flute playing. And he's been speaking about how he and John the Baptist have been, have been called defaming names, drunkards, gluttonous, demon-possessed, and so forth. And he's been speaking about how the whole cities have not responded to their message, to their messages. And at this point, with all of that piled on, most people would be resentful and would be angry about how they've been treated. But not the Lord Jesus. He's rejoicing. He's rejoicing and he's thankful over the ones who have responded, of have been saved, will be saved. He's not resentful. He's thankful. This is Jesus. This is our Savior and this is why we love and adore him. Now, to express how he rejoices in another place, he tells a parable. And the parable is about a shepherd who lost a sheep and found it and when the shepherd comes back and he's found the sheep, he's rejoicing, and 
it's and and he explains in Luke 15:6, Luke 15:6 about the shepherd. When he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. So the shepherd is so happy that he invites his friends and his neighbors to come and celebrate with him, to rejoice with him. That means that when a person is saved from his sins, the Lord Jesus is saying to his friends, Rejoice with me, I found my sheep which was lost. So that means that a lover of the Lord Jesus ju does just that. A lover of the Lord Jesus rejoices with the Lord Jesus when he rejoices. And a lover of the Lord Jesus wants to bring him more joy by bringing him more saved people. A lover of the Lord Jesus wants to see more people saved because that brings more joy to the Lord Jesus. That's the real motivation of evangelism. That's the motivation of evangelism. It's to be a lover of the Lord Jesus and to be able to say to him, I have a surprise for you. <laughs> I found something you lost. Here you go. You lost these souls, and look, I brought them back to you. And my joy is to see you rejoice and to hear you say, Rejoice with me, I found my sheep which was lost. That's evangelism. Now, not only does the Lord Jesus rejoice over souls that are saved, but on the other hand, he cries over souls that are lost, which is what he did in Luke 19.41, Luke 19.41, where it says, and when he was come near, he beheld the city, that'd be the city of Jerusalem. When he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. He cried over Jerusalem. He said in Matthew 23.37, Matthew 23.37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. In John 5.40, John 5.40, he said, And ye will not come unto me, that ye might have life. He weeps over the decision of the lost to not come to him. He cries over the decision of the lost of ye would not and ye will not. And he weeps over the lost. This is Jesus. This is our Savior. This is why we love and adore him. Now, he, he says that God the Father has hid the gospel. He's, he's concealed it. He's hid the gospel from the wise and prudent. So who are these? Who are, these? Who are the wise and prudent? Who are these? Well, first of all, the word prudent means intelligent. You know, someone with a high IQ, you know. So he says that God has hidden the gospel from the wise and the, and the intelligent. In other words, the, 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 the wise are filled with wisdom. The wisdom, what the Bible calls the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of the world. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.21, 1 Corinthians 1.21, speaking of the wisdom of God, versus the wisdom of the world, it says in 1 Corinthians 1.21, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the, wis the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of ple preaching to save them that believe. So here, here we have these two wisdoms. We have the wisdom of God and the world by wisdom or the wisdom of the world. Now, the world with its wisdom is ignorant of God. The world with his wisdom worked like this. When God, their maker, came into the world, the record states in John 1.10, John 1.10, he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. The height of ignorance the world displayed and the world in its wisdom because the Lord Jesus made the world, and when the Lord Jesus came to the world his, 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 that he made, 
the world looked at Jesus and said, a good man, okay. A teacher, all right. A, a starter of a new religion, sure. But my maker, he is not. That's the world. That's what the world said. That's the conclusion of the world with its wisdom. The world did not even recognize its maker when its maker came to earth. So the problem with the wise and the intelligent is that they have this feeling inside. What's the feeling? The feeling is very much like Revelation 3, where it says, uh, where, where the feeling is, I, I have need of nothing. I have need of nothing. That's the feeling of adequateness. That's the feeling. It's the feeling of, well, uh, of being adequate to understand. It's the feeling of sufficient, sufficient to discover the unknown. The problem with the wise and the intelligent is that they say, show me a problem, I'll use my wisdom and my high IQ and I'll solve the problem. That's the feeling of being sufficient for the problems. That results in pride, in pride. And God's response to pride is John, uh, James 4, 6, James 4, 6, where it says, God resisteth the proud. God puts his hand in the chest of the proud. He says, no. That's God's response to pride, resistance. So the wise and the intelligent, the wise and prudent, as it says, but the wise and the intelligent, the problem with the wise and intelligent is that they have this feeling of no need. That's the feeling. I have no need for outside help. That's the problem. And God says that to find Christ, there must be a feeling of emptiness. There must be a feeling of need for God's help. God's help. And this, he says, are the babes. So God the Father has decided to hide the gospel, hide who Christ is from the wise and intelligent who are proud, and instead reveal the gospel uh, and, and who Christ is to babes. Now, who are the babes? Who are the babes that, that God is revealing it to? Well, the babes are those who were those who were not familiar for one of the things is that the babes were not familiar with Jewish law or Talmud, Talmudic law. Now, um, and this was revealed to us in John 7, 48. John 7, 48. John 7, 48 through 49, the, uh, the authorities on the Jewish law, the Talmud, the so-called scribes and Pharisees, made the question in John 7, 48, have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. See, that's the babes. Babes are the people who have not been schooled in the Jewish law or Talmud. They are the babes. Who are also the babes? The babes are described in Acts 4.13. Acts 4.13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled that they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So the babes are the unlearned and the ignorant men. Babes are viewed that way. Babes are helpless. Babes are dependent. Whereas the wise and the intelligent are self-reliant and independent. So babes are humble. And when there was a discussion one time among the disciples, one of those invaluable discussions they had about who was going to be the greatest among them, the Lord settled the argument, and this Lord settled the argument by 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 seeing a little child and say, "Oh, come on, come on over here, come on over here, little kid." So He brings this little child in the middle of them, and 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 and, and He gives an answer to them about which ones of them were going to be the greatest when He He, he heralds this little kid to come over. It says in Matthew eighteen one, Matthew eighteen one. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, 
you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. What a scene that must have been. You know, they're all sitting there saying, okay, now, will you please settle the argument and tell us which one of us is the greatest? And so he, he brings, brings a little kid. I don't know how old this kid was. Maybe the kid was four or something like that. A little kid. A little kid, dependent on, very helpless, dependent. And he says, um, here's your answer right here. This little kid is your answer. Just look at him. He says, you need to be converted and become like him. And unless you don't, you can't come into heaven. There's just no entrance for you. So with that statement, except you be converted and become as little children, the Lord was saying that anyone can be converted. Anyone can become as a little child. Anyone can become as a babe. Anyone can be converted and become dependent on the Lord. Anyone can be converted and see himself as helpless without God. And to the babes, God's, God reveals the gospel and who Jesus is. It's not a matter of discovery. It's a matter of revelation. And the great chapter 53 of Isaiah, which declares the gospel that and how the Messiah died for our sins and made us justified. And at the gate of this great chapter 53 in verse 1 is a question and the question in verse 1 is, who has believed our report? Now, who's speaking there? God, Isaiah, doesn't matter. Who believes this? This, this great. And, and, the, and, the, and the answer to that question, who believes, is given in another question. The second question, which is, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Revealed. Who believes the report? Ask God in Isaiah. It's a matter, it's, it's a matter of, of um, uh, well, is it a matter? Is it a matter in believing Isaiah 53 of who is wise enough and who is intelligent enough to make this great discovery of the gospel and who Christ is in Isaiah 53? No. It's a matter of to whom it's revealed. And, so, and the Lord Jesus rejoices that God the Father has made a selection, has made a division, and has said to this group, no, we're not going to reveal. The wise and the intelligent, the self-sufficient, the self-reliant, the feeling of adequate, that they can meet the, they can meet the challenge. No, no. Hide. But to this other group, this other group, helpless, dependent on God, oh, that's the one we're going to reveal it to. And the Lord Jesus says, good, good, in verse 26, even so, Father, it seemed good in thy sight. So the Lord Jesus said that it was, it, 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 that was good. And in verse 26, he says that he's the revealer. He's the revealer. All things are delivered unto me, O my Father. No man knoweth really who the Son is except for the Father. And neither knoweth any man the Father except for the Son. And he to whom soever... The, the, the Son will reveal him. He's the revealer. So Jesus, God the Son, is going to reveal who God is. He's going to reveal, and, 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 and he's going to do it to babes who have been converted from pride to little children who are dependent on the Lord. Yeah. Okay, now, we see the Lord Jesus addressing God the Father. He, he, he starts off in, in, in uh, verse 25. He says, Father... Father. It's, 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 there's only five times, there's several times here in Scripture where the Lord Jesus addresses God as Father. This, here it is here. He addresses him as Father by saying he's so thankful that God has hid the, the saving truths from the wise and the intelligent and revealed them to, to babes. And so in that context, he calls God Father. Then there's the time when he's standing in front of a dead man's tomb, Lazarus, and he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He's standing in front of there, and, and, he's, and, he's at, and, the, and the, the, the stone that sealed the tube has just been removed, and he, and, and he it says in John eleven forty one, 41, John eleven twenty four 21, 11, 41, John eleven forty one. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. So he's prayed, and then he raises Lazarus from the dead. Then he's thinking about his death. There's another time he's thinking about his death. 
and he has a concern about his death, and the concern is that he, he wants for God the Father to be glorified in his death. And he calls, calls God Father in this regard, in John 12, 27, John 12, 27. He says, now is my soul troubled. He's concerned, he's troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified and I will glorify it again. Then there's another time when again he's thinking about his death on the cross. And again, he's troubled about his death on the cross. And he has another great concern and for which he calls God Father again. And, 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 he, and he's asking this time that he, Jesus, would be glorified by his own death. In John 17, 1, John 17, 1. These words spake Jesus, lifted up his voice to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. And then there's another time when he's just been crucified. He's just been nailed to the cross. He's just started. They, they, the, 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 the torturous death process has begun. And he's looking down from the cross on his executioners. And he's concerned again. He's concerned. He's worried. He's troubled. About what? He's worried for the souls of those very Roman soldiers that have crucified him on the cross. And, he, and now he uses, the, and again he calls on God as Father. He says, Father. And he's talking about his executioners and he wants them to be forgiven of all things. In Luke 23, 33, Luke 23, 33, when they were come to the place which is called Calvary where they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand, the other on the left, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted as Raymond cast lots. So he's asking for his executioners to be forgiven, and he calls the Father. This is Jesus. This is our Savior. That's why we love and adore him. Now, he, he, he's just said in uh, verse 27 that all things were revealed to him and that uh, no one knows the Father except for him, and nobody knows him except the Father, and he to whom the, he's going to reveal him. He's just said that nobody really knows himself and nobody really knows God the Son like God the Father does. No man knows the God the Father like God the Son does and so forth. And now he's going to make this great revelation of who God is. And it's coming in verse 28. And the revelation is a word, come on, come, come, come unto me. That's the revelation. That's a great revelation of who God the Father is. God, we didn't know. God the Father wants people to come to him through Jesus the Son. That's a great revelation. God the Son wants people to come to him. No one could have ever thought, especially the wise and the intelligent, that God would be an inviting God, that God would be inviting man to come to him with all of his troubles, with all of his cares, like the hymn says, is there a heart or bound with sorrow? Is there a life weighed down by care? Come to the cross, each burden bearing, all your anxiety, leave it there. All your anxiety, all your care, bring it to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear, never a friend like Jesus. Who would have imagined that God was like that? That he was going to be a friend? friend, friend friendship with God? Are you out of your mind? Are you crazy? Friend of God? No one would have ever imagined that God wants to be friend with you. See, no one ever imagined that God cared about your anxieties. No one ever imagined that God cares about your cares and your sorrows and your burdens unless Jesus had not revealed this about God in verse 28 by saying, come, come unto me. So he says, come with all your anxieties, come with all your cares, come with your sorrows, come with your burdens, because he cares. This is Jesus. This is our Savior. That's why we love and adore him. And, the, and now, when we see this in verse 28, the, 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 this come, really from what he's been talking about, this is a shift. This is a shift in tone. 
up until now, his tone has been pretty harsh. His tone has been talking about, like we said, guilt and levels of final judgments after death. But now his tone has changed totally. And it's changed, it's changed to a very tender tone, a very gentle invitation. This is so characteristic of the Lord Jesus. He can be, and he is, and he can be, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the tearing lion with the fury of Psalm 2, uh, verse 7. Psalm 2, verse 7, where uh, the fury of, I will declare the decree, the father says, the, uh, the, the son says, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Oh, what a scene is that, taking a vessel and smashing it. Psalm 21.8, Psalm 21.8. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. See, this is one side of the Lord Jesus. This is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But he can also be the tender, both lamb of God and the gentle shepherd. He can be, he is, the Isaiah 53, 7. Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed. He was afflicted. He opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He is the shepherd of Isaiah 40, verse 11. Isaiah 40, verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. So, uh, we see these two sides of him, the, the, the lion, the tearing lion in his fury, the judging lion, and the gentle shepherd, the gentle shepherd. We see this too in this section. We see it in this section because in the verses that preceded, for example, in verse 23, he is the one who's the judge being said, you will be brought down to hell. That's verse 23. He is, he, we see him there as the, as, as the one breaking with the rod of iron, dashing into slithers, casting into fiery oven. But in these verses now, in verse 28, we don't, he's the inviting gentle one who's saying, come unto me. He's got, here he is, he's gathering with his arms, he's carrying in his bosom, he's gently leading. This is our, this, this is, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. This is our Savior. And this is why, th this is our King here. And this is why we love and adore Him. And this is why we also, we also call Him Beloved in whom our soul is well pleased. So, in verses 27 and 28 here, as we said, He's changed His direction. He's changed His direction. Verses 25 and 26, His direction was, uh, toward heaven. He was talking to God the Father. He was speaking to God the Father with thanksgiving. And now in verse 27, he's changed his direction to earth, to the people around him. He tells them that in verse 27, he is the revealer of God. In verse 28, he reveals that God uh, wants them to come broken. God was inviting the broken to come to him for repair. And with that, invitation is very significant when I say broken because he's really saying there you know, all you that labor and heavy laden he's saying come to me you that are broken and, and, he, and he's, he's as we said he separates the babe from the wise and prudent calls, because the babes not only see themselves as helpless and dependent babes see themselves as broken and the wise and prudent see themselves as not broken very simple. Not broken. So what he's really saying in, in verse 28 is, Come unto me, all you that are broken with your struggling under a heavy um, burden. 
So it's really a sheep call that he's giving in verse 28. It's the call to the sheep. And he's calling the sheep who, that are broken, and, and, and they're, they're going to respond as opposed to the sheep that don't see themselves as broken, so why should they respond? And so this is his sheep call today. His sheep call today is to those who see themselves as broken, is to those who see themselves as not just sinners, but dirty, rotten sinners, with a, with a sheep call that, that it kind of goes like this. Anyone who does not see himself as a dirty, rotten sinner, anyone who does not see himself as broken like that, need not come to me because I'm here to save the broken. I'm here to save the dirty, rotten sinners. And this is what, his, this is what he, he meant when, when he said previously, we saw in Matthew 9, 12, Matthew 9, 12, when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. So in other words, he's saying there, if you're whole, you need not come. What do you need me for? So he uses the word when he says, come unto me all ye. He uses the word ye. He didn't have to use that. When he said in Matthew 11, 28, verse 28, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. He says, come unto me all you who are laboring and weighed, weighed down under this uh, load. And by using the word ye, he's saying, you know who you are. I'm calling to you, to you as an individual, not as a group, but to you as a person, an individual. His invitation is to the broken that they should run into the arms of Jesus. He's the Savior. He's able. He's able. So what it says in Hebrews 7.25, 7.25, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. See, this is one of the greatest invitations that the Lord Jesus ever made to man. And it's come right on the heels of this uh, verses like 23, Capernaum, you're going to be brought down to hell. And, and he's declaring that people are going to be, uh, see, see, on one hand, he's saying, these people in Capernaum are going to be brought down to hell. Okay? And, 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 at the, and at the same time, he, he's, he's saying, come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden, I'll give you rest. So he's exalted to heaven. Now, what is that? What is that that he's doing there? One hand, he's saying people are going to be brought down to hell, and the other side, he's going to be going to hell. What is that? That's Romans 5.20 in action. Romans 5.20 in action. Romans 5.20 says, where sin abounded, people being brought down to hell, grace did much more abound, come unto me, and I'll give you the rest of heaven. So where judgment abounds, salvation more abounds. That's Jesus. This is Jesus. This is our Savior. This is why we love him. This is why we adore him. And so the, the, uh, the, this is the great answer. This, this chapter opens in, in verse 3. In verse 3, chapter 11, Matthew 11, 3. Matthew 11, 3. The great question is, he said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And the great answer to this question is, Come unto me. All you that labor and are, and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. That's the answer. He's the one. So he, when he, he makes this call um, to those who feel this great need in their lives, he calls out to those who feel that they just got to find a deliverance from this life of working so hard under this crushing burden of no rest or restlessness, of insecurity, inside, no internal peace. And the Lord makes this call to those who feel this way, and as he does this, the Lord is spanning, he's looking at the total, complete horizon of everyone, of mankind. He sees everyone on earth before he makes this call. He, he sees everyone from Gentiles 
to Jews, from the poor to the rich, from the unknown people to the famous people, to those who live on the street, to those who live in mansions, to those who never went to school, to those who are university professors, from those who have achieved nothing in life to Nobel Prize winners, from those who've never been to a house of worship to theologians, from those who've never seen a Bible to those who have memorized the Bible. So he sees all of these people. He sees this complete span, the spectrum of all people, and he gives, this, he gives this invitation and he inserts this one word, which he didn't have to do, but he says, come unto me all. He didn't have to use that word all. He could have just said, come unto me, you that labor. But he said all, because he doesn't want anyone to be excluded from all those different people he sees. His invitation is to everyone. It's to anyone who has this feeling in their lives, in their lives, that they're tired feeling. They're they're tired of living a life, of working hard to get somewhere. Maybe they don't even know where they want to get to, but just they know they haven't gotten there. And they're just under this heavy load that's giving them this no peace, no rest. They have no rest. And so his invitation is to anyone and everyone who just feels this need in their lives, and that's why he uses the word all. He uses the word all in verse 28. Come ye unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, because he wants no one to be excluded. He says all because 1 Timothy 2.4, he, 1 Timothy 2.4, he will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He says the word all in his invitation because 2 Peter 3.9, 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to him Uh, come to repentance. He says the word all in his invitation because of 1 Timothy 2.6, 1 Timothy 2.6, he gave himself a ransom for all. He says the word all in his invitation because of 1 John 2.2, 1 John 2.2, he's the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So he uses the word all. And so people listen to this you kind of wonder, what were people thinking when they heard this? What do people think? I have a friend. I have a Jewish friend. Far from God. He's an atheist. I, I, I almost smile when I say this. This is his favorite verse in the Bible. <laughs> Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come unto me, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. It's his favorite verse. His invitation in verse 28, it resonates with so many people. Because there's so many different conditions of laboring and struggling in life under a heavy burden. There are those who struggle in life under the load of just the law of God, the Torah, trying to keep the Torah. And and if that's not enough, then all the added weight of the traditions which the scribes and the Pharisees loaded onto people, as it says in Matthew 23, 4. Matthew 23, 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Matthew 7, 8, Mark, sorry, Mark 7, 8, Mark 7, 8. Laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. So, So to those, he promises a rest. And the rest is Romans 10.4. Romans 10.4. Christ is the end of the law. He's a fulfillment. He didn't come to destroy. He came to fulfill. He, Christ, Romans 10.4. He's the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. And then there are those who are struggling in life un, under this, this sense, this burden of sin and guilt. They feel guilty. They feel sinful. Yeah. And like the publican, like the publican in, in uh, Luke 18, 13. Luke 18, 13. The publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. He smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He wouldn't even lift his head up. He couldn't even lift his head up to the sky. And to him, or to people like him, he promises 1 John 1, 9. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And, and then there are those who, who struggle in life under a sense of just not being worthy, not being worthy of, of being like abandoned in life, like the prodigal son, the prodigal son in Luke 15, 19, Luke 15, 19, where he said, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. To them, he promises Ephesians 1, 6, Ephesians 1, 6. He has made us accepted in the beloved, except in the beloved. And then there are those who, who are, there, there are those who just struggle just to make a living, just to get food, just to have enough food to eat, like Job described people like that. In Job 15, 23, 15, 23, it says, he wandered about abroad for bread, saying, where is it? He knoweth, knoweth not the day of darkness is ready at hand. To those who are afraid to die, they struggle with the fear of dying in life. And to those, he promises Philippians 4.19, Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Then there are those who struggle to be rich. They just dream about, oh, if I only had more money, bigger bank account. And, and to them, he had promises Matthew 6.19, Matthew 6.19, lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust dust corrupt, but where thieves break through and steal. Lay up for yourself, and then he talks about treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust corrupt, and thieves do not break through and steal. Then there are those who just are struggling in life because they, have, they know they have no purpose, no direction, just get up in the morning, tell me what I gotta do, I'll do the routine, that's it, and they just do. And to them, he promises Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 20 11, 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. That's purpose, that's direction. So with all these feelings and, and, and struggles in life, a, a person feels that, that uh, I'm just broken. A person would feel broken. He feels brokenhearted. He's afraid. And, that, and, and looking at himself that way with all the struggles, he'd say, well, the invitation is not for me. It's not for me. He said, but when the Lord said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, that meant that the invitation is just for the broken even though he may think the Lord really doesn't want him. Just like blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus was begging on the side of the road, calling out to Jesus, and he was told by others, keep quiet. The Lord doesn't want you. The Lord doesn't, you're, you, you're too broken. You're blind. You're begging. You're sitting on the side of a road. He says, the Lord doesn't want to be bothered for you. You're just a poor blind man begging on the side of the road. It's very easy in life to feel like blind Bartimaeus and you see, where others see you as worthless, as worthless. But it all changed for blind Bartimaeus when he heard the words from a person who said to him, rise, he calleth thee, in, in uh, Mark 10, 46. Mark 10, 46. They came to Jericho, Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and to say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called and they call the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good cheer, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. So, the Lord's invitation in verse 28 is, a, is an invitation of, Rise, he calleth thee. So, the first word that Bartimaeus heard uh, uh, when this began to change for him was the word, Rise, get up. And that's an important word because rising up, that, that, the blind, that's something that blind Bartimaeus, he was blind, but he could get up. He could rise. It's something that he, he could do and something that he had to do in order to get this deliverance from being blind. So the invitation to come is, 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 is first a call to rise. And, and that's an effort that the person has to, to make in order to help. And sometimes that rising is not easy. Uh, I, I got a communication this last week from a Daniel Klein, 
who received the book changed, and he called to say that he was raised in a Jewish home, and he came to know Christ in 1972. And now he's in a wheelchair in a, in a rest home in New York, and he wants to help Jewish people to come to know Christ, but he wants to do it, and he wants to write a book to help Jewish people understand what they must persevere through to come to Christ. So his, his book, he wants to explain the challenges and the conflicts that a Jewish person is going to face in coming to Christ. And he wants to encourage them that it's worth it. It's worth it. So when the Lord says in verse 28, come, he knows the challenges, he knows the conflicts, he knows the efforts that are going to be required, and that's why, he, 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 the, the, but he's also saying, I'll give you rest. In other words, it's worth it. It's worth it. There's a reward. Effort is needed to come to Christ. A person cannot come to Christ by just drifting to Christ. A person cannot come to Christ by floating to Christ, by, by being uh, lukewarm about it, by being indifferent. There's got to be intentional thought. There's got to be perseverance, prayer, diligence, sometimes a fight through all of the obstacles to come to Christ. Just like what the prodigal son had to go through when he decided to leave the pigs and, and come home. And he said in Luke 15, 18, Luke 15, 18, I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. That's an effort that the person has to put in to come to, to, come to the Lord. He's got to, I will arise and go. So the call to rise is a call to come to Christ. It's not a call to come to a new religion. Why? Because it's possible to come to Christianity without coming to Christ. The call to rise is a call to come to Christ. It's not a call to come to a new theology. Why? Because it's possible to believe a whole statement of faith and not come to Christ. The call to rise is not a call to come to a new church. Why? Because it's possible to come to church without coming to Christ. The call to rise is not a call to come to the Lord's table. Why? Because it's possible to come to the Lord's table without coming to Christ. The invitation is very important. Come, it doesn't stop there. It says, come unto me. The invitation is to come to a person, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the call is, in verse 28, is to come to the Lord Jesus and his promise is that he's going to give rest. He's going to give rest. It's going to come from his hands. Rest comes from the hands of the maker of man. John 1.3, John 1.3, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Who better would know the unrest of the heart than the maker of the heart. Isaiah 57, 19. Isaiah 57, 19. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord. I will heal him, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Who better would know how to give rest to the heart than the maker of the heart who said, in John 14, 27, John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. It's been very well said. Uh, very well said. Man is made for Christ, and his heart is without rest until it find, until it rest in him. Now, and then when he said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You find rest unto your soul. His call is to take a yoke, his yoke, upon. A yoke represents submission. It represents submission to work. If an oxen was a, was a really wild ox and very rebellious and refused to take the low, yoke on his shoulder, then that ox refused to work. So coming to Christ involves submitting to Christ. It all, it's a, it's a, for direction in life, for to obey him. He calls the yoke, in verse 29, my yoke, my yoke, which means to be identified with Christ. In another place, he said in Luke 9.23, Luke 9.23, he said unto them all, 
If any man will come after him, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now we all remember when Jesus took up his cross when it was loaded on him as he was to walk that, uh, what do they call it, Rosa, Via, Via Rosa, Via Della Rosa, Rosa, whatever it's called, the, the path of suffering there in, in Jerusalem. We had to walk through the city holding this cross. And, and when a person walked through the streets of Jerusalem carrying his cross, he, there were certain statements that were being made. First statement is, uh, he's carrying the cross. He's really saying, I have no more future in this world. My, my time in this world is coming to an end. I'm carrying this cross. Another statement that he's making there when he's carrying the cross is that I am viewed as shameful and worthless by the world. To follow, to follow Jesus is to follow a person whose very name is used as a swear word today. That's how despised he is. That's what it means to take up his yoke. That's what it means to carry his cross. Now, in verse 28, he said that after coming to him, he'd give rest. And in verse 29, he said that after taking his yoke and learning upon him, that the person would find rest. Oh, right, wait a minute, what is this? First he gives rest, then he finds rest. Well, there's two rests. There's two rests. Coming to Christ brings an initial rest right away to the soul. It's a gift. It's a gift of rest. He says in verse 28, I will give you rest. But then there's another rest that comes slowly to the soul, and it comes in measure as, 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 as more is learned about Christ. And that's called a found rest in verse 29. Learn of me, and you shall find rest unto your souls. So the more that a person learns about Christ, the more he finds an, a, a rest that comes to his soul. Now, the Lord is giving this invitation and, and really, it's an invitation to a, about learning of him and finding rest. It's really an invitation to a new, le- new life. It's like, a, a, it's like a being born into a new life. And the new life comes with a new interest in life, a new preoccupation in life, a, a new meditation in life, a new delight in life. The new life he calls, in verse 29, it's a life of learn of me. It's a learn of me life. And the new interest in life is to be interested in Christ. It, 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 the new life is to have a new preoccupation in life, which is to preoc- be preoccupied with Christ. It, it's a new meditation where our thoughts gravitate towards Christ. It's a new delight, learning about Christ. It's our new discovery about Christ. And, and, and what is it that we discover when we learn about Christ? First of all, we learn he is man. He is man, just like Adam, when Adam saw Eve, and he said, she's like me. She's like man. And he made this statement in Genesis 2.23. Genesis 2.23, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. That's what he called her. And our great discovery in life, as we learn, is that Christ is now bone of our bones and flesh of our flesh. He's 100% man. But our new discovery in life is also that Philippians 2.6, Philippians 2.6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, our new discovery is that he is God. He is man, but he is God. And, 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 who, and the great discovery, as he talked about here, is in verse 29, verse 29, that he is meek and lowly in heart. He is God, he is man, but he is meek and lowly in heart. It's the humili- humility of of Christ. It's the humility of God that we learn about. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And these are the discoveries that are made in this new life and this new submission to Christ. And he says, it's going to be such a change for you compared to the old life. Because the old life, verse 28, is one of laboring, heavy burden, But the new life, in verse 30, of learning of Christ, is going to be, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Light. That's the new one. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the new life in Christ, who is Christ himself. We thank you for for us to live is Christ. That's our life, Lord, all focused around him. Help it to be so, in Jesus' name. Amen.